Next Saturday is the 217th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. And if you ask the average Australian why that was of any interest or significance to Australians, they'd say, can't imagine. It was a British battle fought on the other side of the world. What's it got to do with us? People didn't always think that way. Uh, but to go back to understand its significance, we need to look at what happened here in 1788. Um, Lord Sydney's great gamble for a new British Empire in the Pacific uh, was really behind the settlement of Sydney Cove. Uh, yes, convicts uh, needed to be moved out of hulks on the Thames, and there was no one else who was going to go there to uh, on this extraordinarily long and difficult voyage to the other side of the world to found a new colony uh, who wasn't compelled to do so. Uh, so it wasn't just a convict settlement. It was a deliberate strategic move into a newly contestable area of the Southwest Pacific where other European powers had their eyes firmly fixed. France, for example, um, Comte um, Francois de la Perouse uh, was sent from France to explore the Northwest Pacific, uh, taking over from where Cook had left off on King Louis XVI's orders. While he was there, news came through to Paris that this huge expedition was setting sail from Portsmouth, and by an extraordinary means, uh, right across uh, Russia, word was got to de la Perouse to head south to Botany Bay to observe the arrival of this convict fleet, which had sailed six months earlier. Any suggestion that it was pure coincidence or that he was sent there to claim that area is just fictitious. Uh, he was there for a very good reason. He was sent there by his king. It was a tragedy for him and everybody on board because when he sailed away in his two ships, uh, he disappeared. And uh, nobody knew what had happened to him until 1827. Uh, on the morning of his execution, Louis XVI is alleged to have said, is there any news of La Perouse? One of the um, youngsters who volunteered to go on that expedition was a young artillery uh, student at the uh, French uh, Military Academy, one Napoleon Bonaparte from Corsica. Uh, he was keen on the idea of adventure, but he wasn't selected, which was a great tragedy for the world because had he been selected, he would have died with La Perouse and the world would have been saved potentially an enormous amount of bloodshed and France itself from 15 years of futile warfare. But he wasn't selected, probably because he was a bit mouthy and, uh, and not an ideal candidate for such a long trip, and he was left behind. The French did not accept um, the British settlement of New South Wales, meant that all of New Holland and Van Diemen's land was now British territory, and they sent um, Antoine uh, D'Entrecourt uh, in Recherche and Esperance to Van Diemen's land, searching for La Perouse in theory, but actually scouting to see what was available that France could still claim. Um, and of course, war came to Europe. Bonaparte, long before he was the emperor, became a brutal dictator who cost Europe, including France and Russia, millions of lives. He unleashed a pitiless world war, and he needed to be stopped at sea and on land. And that was the business of the British and others over the period leading right up from 1790 uh, to 1815. It was a war, war for all the world's oceans. Bonaparte was a Corsican gangster um, who lived uh, according to the code of his uh, island, uh, much more in common with the mafia than with statesmanship. Death is nothing, he said, uh, but to live defeat and inglorious is to die daily. Eventually, as we know, he replaced the French monarchy with his own imperial dictatorship. So much for revolutionary principles. One of the places that he got to after he'd succeeded in uh, his wars in Italy was Malta. And I bring this up because, of course, Malta becomes an important part of the British Empire. Um, they surrendered, the Knights of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem surrendered to Bonaparte without a fight in 1798 as his fleet was making its way to Egypt. They loaded the ships with looted treasure from the island, from the Knights of the Hospital's um, great stores of wealth and treasure, and headed on to Egypt. And as we know, they won the Battle of the Mamelukes in front of the, with the Mamelukes in front of the pyramids. But of course, the fleet that was left behind at Abu Kia Bay was turned on by Nelson, uh, 
who uh, managed to annihilate it. Uh, and that was the, really the end of Bonaparte's dreams of a French Egyptian empire and potentially going on uh, like Alexander uh, to, uh, to India. That was always a bit far-fetched, but that was certainly something he had in mind. Now, there you see the 100-gun French battleship Lorient blowing up, and inside her were some of the finest treasures looted from the Egyptians, from the pharaoh's tombs, and also the uh, loot that he'd taken from Malta. So an incalculable loss to humanity when Lorient blew up. Um, and, of course, part of her mainmast eventually became the coffin given to Nelson by his captains and in which he still lies inside St. Paul's. Um, Bonaparte unfortunately escaped from Egypt. This was a, a great tragedy for the world. Nelson uh, tried to catch up with him, but he just didn't have enough fast frigates. And he said, were I to die this moment, want of frigates would be stamped on my heart. Um, and Bonaparte got back to Paris, of course, and uh, thereafter took over all the power in the, in the French state. Meanwhile, um, one Matthew Flinders, continuing Cook's work, um, is now in the uh, area, in, uh, working from Sydney in Investigator uh, during the Peace of Amiens between 1802 and 1803, and his job is to circumnavigate what was then, of course, still called New Holland. And he took with him Bungaree, an Aboriginal sailor, whose picture you see there, and set off to make sure that uh, there was no great um, gulf leading up from uh, South Australia to the north, because nobody knew what lay in South Australia. And of course, simultaneously, Nicolas Baudin was sent by Bonaparte to this part of the world uh, because uh, there was still this idea that there might be a colony that could be carved out of New Holland. They met at Encounter Bay, perfectly amicable uh, meeting. Uh, neither country was at war at that particular time. And uh, Flinders and Baudin were both navigators and very uh, interested in what the other knew about what they had just been uh, navigating past. Baudin died on the way back, and he had a very jealous uh, 2IC called Perron. And he wrote a secret memo in 1804 to Napoleon urging that the French seize Sydney with French Marines sent to arm the Irish convicts so they could stage a rebellion. Not an improbable scenario. Disarm the British garrison and seize the governor. So that was his idea as to what to do. And Bonaparte, in theory, was interested in it. But even before Trafalgar, was a huge ask to get a French Marine battalion across the world uh, in a state where they could fight and, and uh, do what was asked of them. So there was never a plan to do it as such, only a suggestion from Perron. Uh, whatever his plans may have been before Trafalgar, after the defeat in 1805, uh, Bonaparte had no illusions about seizing New South Wales. It was now logistically impossible. He didn't have the means, and he certainly didn't have the capability for sending a French fleet to reinforce any gains he might have made there. So Sydney was an ocean too far for Bonaparte. And, of course, at Trafalgar, there was a smashing victory, uh, and it severely limited French imperial ambition beyond Europe, and importantly, it kept Russia in the war. Britain did not wish to fight alone. Every time Britain had a success, it encouraged the Tsar and later the Prussians to come in and remain on Britain's side. And that was important. Of course, it's no, I'm not going to go into it here because everyone watching knows exactly what happened on the 21st of October. Suffice to say that it was a great breaking with tradition. Normally, fleets of ships hove up alongside each other, blasted away, somewhat um, um, negligently uh, until they ran out of ammunition, they drifted apart. That was not Nelson's way. He formed up in two lines. He took the pain and the punishment as the two sh lines of ships, his own and Collingwood's, descended on the French fleet, and he cut off the Franco-Spanish uh, van so that he only had to contend with the ships that were immediately within his reckoning, and he lost his life doing so. His two IC that day was Vice Admiral Sir Cuthbert Collingwood. He went on to become the great implementer of the success at Trafalgar. He blockaded the French Navy, such as it was, in Toulon and on the Atlantic coast, uh, 
and he stayed at sea from 1805 um, till his death in 1810, uh, and he hardly came home at all. It's not for nothing that his name was once greatly remembered and revered as Nelson's uh, great friend and implementer. Alfred Thayer Mahan, the American who wrote The Influence of Sea Power on History, described the post-Trafalgar Royal Navy as that dis far distant line of storm-beaten ships on which the Grand Army of France never looked, but which stood between it and the dominion of the world. And that's pretty much a description of what blockade gives you. It's the capacity to confine the enemy so that he can't do what he would wish to do, allowing you to use the sea for your own purposes. One of those purposes, of course, was to get back into um, <clears throat> the Iberian Peninsula and to fight back against Bonaparte and his Marshal Soult. Uh, Sir John Moore was chosen and led 26,000 British regulars into uh, Portugal and uh, northern Spain. Unfortunately, he was up against something like 300,000 French regulars, and it quickly became obvious that uh, he couldn't win and he needed to retreat. And the retreat was effected to Corona in northern Spain, and there a defensive victory was uh, achieved, um, and the 26,000, most of them anyway, were evacuated by sea with no interference from the French Navy. Command of the sea enabled the landing and it enabled the rescue, and that'll be a theme of the maritime empire. Amphibious operations uh, give you as much of the battle as you wish and as little as you need, uh, whereas a country that doesn't have amphibious uh, capability and command of the sea is, of course, always trapped uh, by the decisions it makes on land. A British army was saved to fight again by the Navy. Uh, there were still French ships. There was a French fleet in the Basque Roads blockaded there. And uh, that didn't suit the British, and they sent in Admiral Lord Alexander Cochrane, RN, who uh, over a period of a week uh, really affected a second Trafalgar. Nobody talks about it because it wasn't one day of stunning victory, and Cochrane's name is not now remembered. But effectively, the entire French Atlantic fleet was first blockaded and then either sunk or captured by the Royal Navy. And quite a number of the ships that go on to serve in the British line of battle were in fact captured at Basque Roads in 1809. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the French are not inactive in the Indian Ocean, operating from Ile de France, which we now call Mauritius. They were raiding the East Indiaman trade from India around the Cape and back into the Atlantic. In 1806, the British lost four RN frigates and seven East Indiamen to the six uh, very competently manned and, and uh, fought French frigates operating. This was the worst defeat suffered by the Royal Navy during the entire war, and it left the Indian Ocean and its vital trade convoys by the Cape exposed to attack. One of the things that they were bringing from India was saltpeter. Saltpeter is vital to the making of gunpowder, um, and the British Army needed that gunpowder. It wasn't optional. There was no other great source of saltpeter in the world, and it had to be got to, uh, to the British Army if it was going to fight Napoleon. So a decision was taken that this was a classic case of a job for the Royal Marines. And in 1810, Ile de France was attacked and taken from the sea by the Royal Marines, and the threat to British commerce in the Indian Ocean was eliminated in a swift amphibious operation. The French frigates were seized, and Ile de France became Mauritius and became a British uh, dependency and it sealed the Indian Ocean off from the French, who no longer had the capability to interrupt trade. But that's a classic example of amphibious capability being used to advantage. In the Adriatic, a young man by the name of Sir William Host, or he became Sir William Host, fought a long since forgotten battle at Lisa against the Venetian and French frigates. And he flew his, his signal, remember Nelson, as they went into battle, uh, William Host took on and defeated the French flagship and uh, scattered the rest of the, the Franco-Venetian fleet. The Royal Navy was now fighting every battle with France with a Nelsonic tradition of victory behind them, which gave them um, a morale advantage that was incalculable. 
Then, of course, um, war broke out with the Americans in 1812. And uh, now the Americans claim they won the war because they won the Battle of New Orleans, which was fought after the peace had already been signed. And of course, uh, Fort McHenry didn't fall despite the rocket's red glare and bombs falling in air, all that stuff. But the truth is that the only thing that mattered in the War of 1812 was the American determination to go north and attack Britain's uh, colonies in uh, what's now Canada. After the um, American War of Independence, uh, large numbers of British Empire loyalists fled north from American persecution and settled uh, what is now Canada. And they were not enthusiastic about being retaken uh, into the North American shield and the, the United States by uh, and the invasion and occupation. Now, it mattered that there was sea power involved in this because the British were able to, um, first of all, defeat uh, the immediate threat off the coast in the case of uh, the Shannon and Chesapeake battle. And then later, as we'll see, they were able to put pressure in the Chesapeake Bay area and prevent the Americans from diverting all their strength uh, going north into uh, uh, Canada. There's Shannon. Um, uh, Shannon was operating day in, day out, um, firing at barrels in the sea and training its men, whereas Chesapeake, of course, was in Boston Harbor. And one of the things we know is that if you want to win battles at sea, gunnery has got to be excellent. And it was Royal Navy training in gunnery and battle experience which counted against the United States Navy in that encounter. However, under John Paul Jones, uh, the young United States Navy then took on and defeated uh, two British frigates, um, which were convoy escorts in the North Sea. Um, Constitution was a much bigger, heavier and better armed uh, vessel than these smaller Royal Navy ships. Constitution never came up against a British line of battleship. If John Paul Jones had come up against a 74 or 100 gun ship of the Royal Navy, he would have been in a lot of trouble. But quite rightly, the Americans celebrate the victories of the young United States Navy in its encounter with British frigates. But what really mattered was the British ability to put troops ashore in the Chesapeake and to put pressure on the uh, Americans to desist from their attempts to take Canada by force. Had they done so, the United States would now stretch from the Rio Grande to the Arctic Circle. That's what was at stake in the 1812 war. And it didn't, it didn't work, partly because of the skill and success of um, Canadian irregulars and the British Army uh, in defeating them and the weather, but also because they simply didn't have the capacity to defend themselves in their heartland, which was Baltimore and Washington, and to be pursuing uh, dreams beyond the Great Lakes. So the British burnt the White House. Well, why did they do that? Well, it was because the year before, the town of York, now known as Toronto, was burnt to the ground by Americans who'd gone north uh, with the intention of um, destroying Canadian ability to govern themselves. So that's the explanation for that particular tragedy. And of course, uh, the Americans remember it as a heroic moment in their history, and one can understand why they do. But this is what was really all about. It was about getting men ashore in the Chesapeake, able to put that pressure on Baltimore, which was the more important city, and also onto Washington. Um, Fort McHenry was never taken, but uh, it certainly came under fire. And it was partly as a result of that and the blockade of American cities and the trade that went with the uh, commerce to Britain that the peace treaty was signed. Meanwhile, back in the peninsula, Wellington has taken over the job from Moore, who was killed at Karana, of trying to occupy, the, um, with the assistance of the Portuguese army, the French who've invaded Spain and uh, uh, are uh, th threatening to, uh, to take Portugal, Britain's oldest ally as well. The lines of Torres Vedras were set up by Wellington outside Lisbon to defend the city, which was mostly what mattered. Um, but note what I've written here. In Portugal, Wellington had few heavy guns under his command and the Navy had provided them. It wasn't until late in the war that Wellington's army was equipped with its own 
heavy guns necessary for sieges. Until then, the Navy did its best in this vital role. In other words, Wellington wasn't just receiving food and reinforcements and horses and equipment by sea. He was also receiving guns and the gunpowder made from the saltpeter that the Navy was now able to convoy through from India. Of course, Waterloo is the culmination of a decade, 1805 to 1815, of blockade. It kept the Allies in the war, that blockade, and it made sure that when the British came to fight, they didn't fight alone, they had the Prussians with them. And we really should consider Waterloo an Anglo-Prussian rather than just a British victory. Uh, it certainly was the case that, as Wellington said, give me Blucher or give me Knight, and Blucher turned up just in time. After Waterloo, Bonaparte surrendered uh, and was taken across the channel by the Royal Navy. And in Torquay, uh, in Devon, people came out in boats hoping to see the captive Corsican tyrant. Um, he anticipated being allowed to go ashore and live his life as a quiet country gentleman like his elder brother. Um, he was somewhat deluded if he thought that, uh, because, of course, after he'd escaped from Elba once, he was certainly not going to be given another chance to restart uh, the wars. Uh, on the continent. And so he was shipped off on HMS Bellerophon. He's very lucky not to be tried and hanged for his crimes against the peace of Europe. And he must have realized the scale of what he was up against while sailing in Bellerophon, because he famously wrote, wherever the British Navy could float a ship, they opposed my plans. In other words, he finally understood the significance of sea power to grand strategy. That had never really been top of his list of things. He once said that he was a hero on land and a coward at sea. After the British Parliament outlawed the slave trade, there was 60 years of British naval patrolling to suppress the Atlantic slave trade. We hear a great deal about Britain as a slave uh, power, and of course it was, and slavery went on in the Caribbean long after the slave trade had been suppressed. But after Trafalgar, and while the war was still going on, the Royal Navy established the Preventative Squadron, which operated all those years off the West African coast and saved millions of black lives who would otherwise have been lost. And not a, it, 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 there was no inconsiderable cost to this. Something like 10,000 Royal Navy sailors died on duty, mostly from sickness and in battle with slave ships. There is also some suggestion that as it was no longer possible for the Americans to import slaves directly from Africa, the value of slaves went up. I'm not sure how much truth there is in that. But it's still worth pointing out to those who think that uh, the balance sheet is only ever one way, that this was a major humanitarian effort made by Britain and its Royal Navy to prevent the worst excesses of the Middle Passage. Another place where slavery was opposed was, of course, Algiers. Um, Christian slaves would be being seized uh, from across the uh, Mediterranean and indeed from the coast of Ireland and from Cornwall and Devon uh, for centuries. C white Christian slaves were taken back uh, to serve uh, in uh, North Africa in particular. Uh, and uh, the piracy on ships going through the Mediterranean became intolerable. So Admiral Sir Edward Pellew, one of Nelson's band of brothers, uh, was sent off with a major fleet to tell the day of Algiers, the local potentate, that um, he was going to free up all the European slaves under his command or his palace was going to be bombarded to bits. He could take his choice. Um, he refused initially, so the fleet went in, and unfortunately there were 900 Royal Navy sailors killed in action as they came under bombardment from the fortresses in the Bay of Algiers. But eventually they got in, they uh, did what needed to be done, and the day of Algiers did indeed free 3,000 European slaves. Unfortunately, he probably seized exactly the same number of Jews uh, who he put under slavery. So I'm not defending this as an example of humanitarianism, pure and simple, merely pointing out that 
everybody needed to get on top of piracy and slave trading uh, and seizure of slaves. I've recently come back from Catalonia, and there most of the coastal fortresses were put in place in order to allow villagers to flee inside them when slave ships appeared off the Spanish coast uh, throughout uh, uh, the European Middle Ages. British naval assistance in the Greek War of Independence was significant. The Battle of Navarino was fought in 1827, was an Anglo-French Anglo fleet there. They destroyed the Ottoman naval forces, and that certainly contributed to Greece being able to win its War of Independence and get clear of the Sultanate and become a nation again in 1830. And uh, there is still gratitude expressed in Greece for that. What else do you do with a navy that is no longer needed to fight major battles? Well, you start exploring the, the world. And uh, the two ice-strengthened ships, Terra and Erebus, later tragically lost with Franklin in the Northwest Passage, they sailed into the Antarctic in 1841, 42, and 43, three seasons in a row under James Clark. Um, this was at a time when, uh, since Cook, almost nobody had actually seen the Antarctic continent. Cook hadn't, uh, because he could uh, not get past the, the, the ice shelf that now bears uh, Ross's name. Um, the ice smashed against the ship so violently that their mast shook in a beating that would have destroyed any ordinary vessel. The most significant danger they came to was when these ships, which were entirely sail-powered, remember, were nearly collided, which would have been a disaster for both of them. What else do you do? Well, of course, famously, the Voyage of the Beagle, 1831 to 36, around the world. Charles Darwin was the young man who was taken along on the surveying voyage as a naturalist. He wasn't uh, then thought of as being an important component of what was being done. Robert Fitzroy was the important man as captain of the Beagle. He was sent to chart the uh, South American coastline and in particular to get much more accurate uh, charts of uh, the Magellan Passage and Drake Passage to make sure that uh, fewer ships were wrecked going through there. This is long before the days of a Panama Canal. It was an important waterway for getting into the Pacific. But of course, in reality, we now remember Darwin and have forgotten Fitzroy, uh, which is un unfair because though Fitzroy was a strange and deluded man in many ways and eventually slashed his own throat with a razor um, He uh, and took his own life. He was the founder of the meteorological service. Uh, the idea that you could predict the weather seemed totally improbable to most people. But as more and more ships and land points became available uh, from which weather could be reported, it became increasingly possible to get a general idea of what ships were setting out into and indeed whether they should sail at all. So one's an intellectual achievement, uh, pure and simple. The other is also a physical achievement of Fitzroy's in setting up the meteorological service, which we now take so much for granted. <clears throat> Making the sea safe uh, involved putting in lighthouses and charting dangerous reefs, uh, where other countries took the view that charts were national secrets. The Royal Navy's Admiralty charts were fully available to the mariners of the world and must have saved countless ships and their passengers and cargoes across the world's sea lanes. And of course, we have around our coast many lighthouses that were put in uh, with British capital um, in order to make sure that passage to and from the United Kingdom was less hazardous than it would otherwise have been. Trade followed the flag, it always does. And the British Maritime Empire expanded every decade uh, from 1815 onwards. New Zealand is an interesting case study in what the Navy brought uh, to uh, the whole business of colonization. William Hobson was an RN captain who was sent to the Bay of Islands to see what he could do about the appalling situation in which Maoris were being preyed on and exploited uh, by whalers and sealers and other uh, ne'er do wells who would turn up uh, with ships, some with guns and uh, effectively uh, make life impossible for the local Maori people. Um, the decision was made by the British government to offer legal protection to Maori tribes in both the North and the South Island. And tribes 
came to the Bay of Islands to Kororarika, now Russell, uh, and the Waitangi Treaty House, where James Busby, the British resident, made his home available to sign a treaty whereby, from the Maori point of view, the shadow of the land would pass to Queen Wikitoria, uh, but they would retain the substance of the land. That's certainly what they thought they were signing with the Treaty of Waitangi, and um, the two different translations uh, bear certain differences in interpretation. But Hobson was an honest man trying to do his best to secure uh, justice and peace for Maori tribes uh, in New Zealand. He wasn't thinking in terms of it becoming a place where huge numbers of British settlers would go. That, that thought, I don't think, ever crossed his mind. It was a hellhole of the Pacific and something needed to be done. And there you see the signing of the treaty by Maori tribes. Now, very shortly after the signing, the French Nantes Bordelais company's ship arrived, claiming that they owned a large chunk of Banks Peninsula, near where Christchurch is today. They had negotiated for it with the Maori tribe down there uh, and had um, bought it from the Maori, from their point of view. They had 65 settlers on board, all of whom fully anticipated living under the French flag in a new French colony. Well, they were in a fairly uh, terrible state, these French settlers. They were allowed to come ashore by Hobson and who set up their bread ovens and they settled down to restore their spirits. Meanwhile, Hobson sent HMS Britomart under the command of Captain Owen Stanley down to Akaroa on Banks Peninsula where the French were heading. And there, of course, they set up the British flag. Uh, and that reinforced British sovereignty over Akaroa. Two Maori tribes from the area had signed the Treaty of Waitangi, but just in case anybody was in any doubt, when the 65 French settlers and Bishop Pompalier arrived uh, a week later, uh, they could live there as, as French people, but they lived there under a British magistrate under the Union Jack. And of course, that completely choked off the resupply of French settlers coming as government migrants from France. Both islands of New Zealand were now indisputably British, and that hadn't been entirely clear before uh, Britomart went down there. There are Royal Navy battleships in Malta going to the Crimean War with Russia, 1853 to 56, an area of the world that we've tragically become all too familiar with once again, the Crimean Peninsula. Um, what was the role of these ships? Well, obviously there were troop transports, but they also spent a good deal of their time using their guns to suppress uh, the fire from Russian uh, batteries uh, on the Crimean Peninsula. Um, it was a very important role. It's impossible to imagine the Crimean War being fought without uh, the Royal Navy in support. Eventually, the Tsars uh, came to the realization that he could either have peace on the Crimean Peninsula or the Royal Navy would go through on its threat to turn up and level St. Petersburg. And he chose very wisely to, uh, to come to an arrangement on the Crimean Peninsula. But it had un, unintentional consequences. Um, every time Britain and Russia went to war, whether it was over the Crimea or later over Afghanistan, uh, there was a Russian scare. And uh, the, the, uh, the cities of uh, Australia and New Zealand felt themselves to be very exposed. And indeed they were. Um, how realistic it is to imagine a Russian fleet turning up and bombarding either Melbourne or Sydney or Auckland is open to conjecture. But the consequence was that this fear of bombardment caused successive war scares. And both before and after the Crimean War, Russia did exhibit an interest in the Pacific and in Britain's many colonies. I don't think it was realistic. Uh, they certainly didn't have the means to do more than harass and perhaps loot. Uh, Melbourne was a very wealthy city. But first of all, uh, Her Majesty's Victorian ship Nelson came out to Port Phillip Bay. And then when she became obsolete, uh, Cerberus was sent out. And she was a very exciting new development, a turret gunship. Um, and she was uh, in Port Phillip Bay for many years, capable of going out and taking on whatever was just outside the bay. She had come from Britain by sea, 
but there was no suggestion that she was the equivalent of a line of battleship. She was what her name suggests, a guard dog. And of course, if you're a Sydney cider uh, and you don't uh, think much of Melbourne, you could claim that Cerberus like the dog, was the dog that guarded the gates of hell. There she is there. The idea was to prevent a bombardment from the sea. There she is arriving there with the old ship, uh, Nelson, in the background. The other thing that happened, of course, is coastal gun batteries were put in wherever uh, cities needed defending. I took that photograph earlier in the year. That's of a disappearing rampart gun on North Head, looking out over the Waitemata Harbour uh, from in Auckland. And there you can see this modern city of Auckland there behind. None of these guns, including those uh, at, uh, at in, in, surrounding Sydney Harbour, ever fired a shot in anger. Uh, like the Palmerston forts in England, they were an insurance policy, and as it turns out, they were never needed. Of course, um, Andrew Lambert, who is the expert in this area, says if the Russian Navy had ever dared to shell Sydney, Melbourne, or Auckland, the Royal Navy would have leveled St. Petersburg, and the Russians knew it. So I suppose you could call that extended deterrence. The other thing, of course, that was made possible by the long peace post Trafalgar was the settlement of the empire in mass migration to America, but also, of course, from our point of view, to Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And here is the famous painting, The Last of England. You can see the young couple with a baby tucked under her shawl there, who are looking back knowing that they will never come back. They'll never have the opportunity. They faced many dangers, but none from an enemy navy. British naval mastery guaranteed they were safe from attack and, and from the interruption of the decades long migration opportunity, which gave the chance for so many people who were destitute uh, and landless and incapable of improving their lot in Britain and Ireland from getting away. My own forebears uh, left Ireland uh, just after the potato famine to head to New Zealand to. Uh, to live better lives than they could possibly have done in Ireland at that time. Um, <clears throat> of course, in addition to the convict settlements, there was also the free settlement. And one of them, of course, was Adelaide. Uh, and there were large numbers of people taken under the Wakefield schemes to Wellington, uh, to Christchurch, and to Adelaide. And these are the people queuing up there on the dockside to get away from destitution. Steamships made the passage to the far side of the world much faster and much safer than sailing ships alone. And it also made it possible, of course, to steam troops around the world. And the bottom left-hand uh, image there shows a troop ship, Crocodile, uh, that would have been uh, carrying garrisons from one part of the empire to another uh, to ensure that uh, British uh, troops or where they needed. There she is again. The Birkenhead drill, of course, was the famous occasion when in 1852, uh, the troop ship Birkenhead struck an uncharted rock off Cape Town. Uh, there was no chance that the majority of men were going to be able to get away. And the women and children were put into the only available small boats and allowed to escape before the men were given the opportunity to try and save themselves. Most famously, of course, the Birkenhead drill was enacted during the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. It wasn't fun going by sea all those uh, long sea miles to the other side of the world. Um, and uh, there were tragedies when children died of scarlet fever. It was a fairly awful experience for the majority of families traveling so far. And of course, very few of them could ever return. Um, there's uh, East Circular Quay in 1866. I'm just making the point that war was no impediment to maritime trade and communications. And uh, it became swifter and swifter and more and more efficient way of getting goods and people around the world. Trade and migrants came by sea. Um, to Australian and New Zealand ports to build the colonies and make lives better using British-made manufactured goods. And in return, back to the mother country went wool, wheat, and gold. 
which enriched Britain and the textile industry and fed the people of Britain. And of course, the gold was also made good use of as well. But that's what Britain essentially needed from its colonies, somewhere for people to go and to get raw materials back from. It was a mercantile arrangement. Over 75% of the world's ocean going ships were British owned at that time. And they carried uh, the goods that uh, tr went by sea uh, all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, um, all the way up the Atlantic. That changed, of course, when the Suez Canal was put through. There's Benjamin Disraeli, who was the great architect with the French of getting the Suez Canal dug and, and, and made. And it was opened in 1869, and that made the sea lanes of the world much faster and safer. And east of Suez was no longer quite as difficult to get to as it had been hitherto. And of course, Britain's uh, jewel on the crown, India, was now far more accessible to everybody. And uh, it was a much easier to secure uh, the uh, northwest frontier from the Russians because of the Suez Canal. There it is there. It was possible to send troops swiftly to defend sea lanes of communication to India and, of course, all the way to China and to fight frontier wars, reinforcements. The British Army was never large. It needed to be moved quickly to where it was needed. You couldn't garrison everywhere simultaneously to the degree that would be needed if there were local rebellions. That point was very well proved during the Indian Mutiny, of course. There's um, Sydney. Um, ships in direct communication, mainly with Britain, but elsewhere as well, long before Federation. Each colony had its own relationship with the mother country. Australians were never very enthusiastic about Britain's friendly relationship with the Japanese. Um, British battleships were the ones which Admiral Togo uh, used, uh, bought in, from British yards at uh, the Battle of Shishima when the Russian Baltic fleet steamed all the way around the world to avenge what had happened at Port Arthur and was utterly defeated in Tsushima Straits by Admiral Togo. Um, and the IJN had come of age in a way that no one suspected. Uh, the only thing that's comparable with it, I suppose, in our own time is the speed with which the Chinese Navy has been built by the PRC in the last 20 years. Admiral Togo was hailed as the new Nelson after his complete destruction of the Russian fleet off Korea. And he was firing 12-inch guns on a flat trajectory, which just completely destroyed Admiral Rodoshevensky even before he got in range. And he, of course, had to be picked up out of the water after his flagship was sunk. You don't get a much more total victory than that. In 1905, in Sydney, and also in uh, Newcastle, Brisbane, and Melbourne, there were enormous celebrations to remember Trafalgar a century on, um, and uh, Australian flags were flung out in cities. Loyal and patriotic speeches were made according to Trove. There were reenactments. Uh, Nelson's Trafalgar signal, England expects that every man will do his duty, was uh, flown. The town hall was uh, packed with people, all of whom wished to pay tribute to Nelson and what he'd achieved uh, for Australia. Impossible to imagine anything remotely like that happening today because memories are pretty short. And of course, in um, 1908, an event occurred which uh, rattled the British. Uh, the Americans were about to send a great white fleet around the world. Uh, this was Mahan's fleet that Roosevelt had built and uh, they had no intention of calling into either Australia or New Zealand, but both countries' prime ministers got in touch with Roosevelt and asked if they could be sent. So that's Richard John Seddon in New Zealand and uh, Alfred Deacon in Australia. And the Americans were very happy to come to both countries. Uh, my grandmother, as a young soprano, sang on board the American flagship in um, Auckland Harbour and was given a magnificent photograph of the fleet at anchor, which hangs now in the RNZ in Museum. Um, but in uh, Sydney, uh, the same thing occurred. Huge numbers of people came out to see these American battleships, 16 of them 
steaming into Sydney Harbour and then going on later down to Melbourne. Uh, and it only underscored for most people the fact that um, the British were only sending one guard ship per five years to this part of the world, uh, whereas here were the Americans with 16 modern battleships steaming across the Pacific. And uh, consideration had to be given to where exactly Australia's future security lay. Um, there is HMS Powerful, the last of the Australasian Station Royal Navy battleships. Um, well, in fact, it wasn't a battleship, it was a heavy cruiser. Um, and that she was withdrawn in 1912. Um, by that stage, it was obvious that the Royal Australian Navy had to be re-equipped and given the capacity to defend this part of the world from not just the Japanese, who were notionally uh, British allies, but from the uh, German Far East fleet uh, based uh, in northwest China. Uh, that was what was uh, obsessing people by 1912. And so HMAS Australia, a 12-inch gun battle cruiser and a range of uh, light cruisers uh, and destroyers were built in Britain, and they made up the first fleet unit, uh, two uh, E-class submarines, AE-1 and AE-2, came out as well. They came the year before, and uh, or it came the year after, in, in uh, 1912. This fleet was seen by one million uh, Sydney siders steaming in to Sydney Harbour in October 1913. There's a strong case for saying that Australia has never made a better defence investment than it did in this first fleet unit, because it went to war within 12 months. And uh, had it not been here, uh, then uh, it would have been a very different matter. The German Admiral Count Graf von Spee wrote to his wife saying, well, of course, things have changed now. We will have to avoid at all costs HMAS Australia, because she completely outranges every German gun in the Pacific. And indeed he did. But that's a story for another day. The enthusiasm for the Royal Australian Navy was uh, palpable. Uh, the Navy needs you, don't read Australian history, make it. I don't know why they've got a red ensign there, but that's, uh, that's uh, obviously a mistake by whoever made up that, that poster. The image that you see on the right-hand side is of Rear Admiral George Patey, a Royal Navy officer now working for the Royal Australian Navy or the Australian government as our fleet commander. And he is taking over from uh, Admiral uh, uh, King uh, Halsey. Sorry, I've lost the name for a moment there. Um, and uh, this is the moment of hand handover. Um, this is the moment when the Royal Australian Navy uh, becomes commanded by the Australian government uh, with its own ships. And that's an important moment in our national history. If at some point someone had said that the future iconography of Australia would be the digger, would be the soldier, that would have seemed very far-fetched at this time. The Navy was the professional service. The state militias were very small scale by comparison, made up of very fine uh, people, but certainly not uh, thought of as having uh, the great capability which they did demonstrate later during the First World War. It was the Navy that the people of Australia relied on and thought was going to dominate the future of Australian security. So, in August 1914, the Australian Navy was, as Sir George Patey, the fleet commander, said, in all respects ready for war, and it, uh, it steamed off from Sydney, and in the case of HMAS Australia, did not return again for another four years, having spent most of that time, of course, with sister ships in the battle cruiser squadron at Scapa Flow. Um, but there it is. That's the end of the period we're talking about, stretching for 110 years, really. Um, Trafalgar was fought when Sydney was still an indefensible village. Um, and uh, I contend that Trafalgar was the most important battle in Australia's 19th century history. But uh, that is, of course, open to uh, contradiction by others if they choose to do so. Uh, but that's certainly the way it looks
from my perspective, um, because without Trafalgar, it's hard to imagine the peaceful settlement of this country being so easily achieved. So we still have an immortal memory, that of Horatio Lord Nelson, and uh, the Royal Navy still, of course, toasts him every 21st of October. Um, the Royal Australian Navy has moved on to other battles and thinks about other things now, but there's no doubt in my mind that he deserves the place in history that was given him by the British uh, because he was, without doubt, the uh, presiding, uh, his, his victory was the presiding one that made possible the, the empire that uh, we've now, uh, we are the inheritors of in the way in which we live our lives in the West. Uh, so the British Maritime Empire had been built by 1914, and now, of course, it had been defended in two world wars in the 20th century by the British and by the people who had left Britain and gone to live elsewhere in the empire. And that concludes my presentation this morning.